I'm Jimmy Fallon. I'm Madison Allworth. I'm Bill Hemmer, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Wednesday, April 5th, 2023. I'm Jared Halpert. For the first time in American history, a former president is arrested and arraigned on felony charges. But it isn't slowing down Donald Trump's front-running Republican campaign. The overall sense of grievance, the overall tone, the overall belief that the elites and the establishment are out to get the average guy. I mean, that is the sweet spot for Trump's rhetoric. I'm Alex Hogan. The nation's top defense officials testified before Congress warning that the U.S. military must outpace China's in order to maintain peace. However, some believe that our military's development is growing weaker. We are well behind the Chinese, and that ought to just sober us all to the threat that we face. And I'm Nicole Parker. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. Not guilty. Donald Trump, the former president and candidate to serve as 47th president, uttered those words, entering a plea in a New York City courtroom on 34 felony counts. The former president surrendered to authorities. He was booked and walked, showing no obvious emotion into a courtroom to face a judge. The Manhattan District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, says Trump falsified business records to conceal hush money payments made to women alleging affairs ahead of the 2016 election. Donald Trump was arraigned on a New York Supreme Court indictment returned by a Manhattan grand jury on 34 felony counts of falsifying business records in the first degree. Bragg says since he took office, additional evidence was made available that his predecessor did not have, leading to his decision to seek a grand jury's indictment. I bring cases when they're ready. Uh, Having now conducted a rigorous, thorough investigation, the case was ready to be brought. And it was brought. Photographs from inside the courtroom showed former President Trump seated at the defense table between his team of lawyers. He did not make any remarks to reporters on his way in or out of court. Instead, immediately flying back and holding a campaign style response surrounded by hundreds of supporters at Mar a Lago. The only crime that I have committed is to fearlessly defend our nation from those who seek to destroy it. Trump also addressed separate investigations in Georgia and at the U.S. Justice Department looking in the potential criminality surrounding allegations that could also lead to charges in more court proceedings. The legal peril has so far had no noticeable impact on the former president's third run for office. His campaign reports raising millions of dollars over the past few days and polling shows Trump remains the far and away front runner for the Republican nomination. It's It's never good legally when a former president, presidential candidate is going to court and pleading not guilty to a a felony. Josh Crossauer is a Fox News Radio political analyst. That said, when we look at Republican primary politics these days, Donald Trump is still beloved by the Republican base. Mm -hmm. His voters and Republican voters writ large view him as being wronged by brag by by the other district attorneys and they agree that he's being aggrieved and look that this dynamic is not going to change anytime soon trump is now sucking the political oxygen out of the room right before you know, a lot of republicans like ron DeSantis were getting ready to announce their their presidential campaigns and i i think the challenging dynamic writ large for trump's republican challengers now is that It's going to be hard for them to get a whole lot of attention as long as this cloud and and perhaps future legal clouds are hanging over the former president. Because that's really an important part of this story, too, right, is we saw this history happen yesterday in lower Manhattan, the first time ever that a former president has faced a judge, been arrested, all of that. But I think the point you're making is it may not be the last time. You have the investigation in Georgia. You have the special counsel investigations at the Justice Department. Those two could end in some sort of legal peril for Donald Trump. And if they do, how is that campaign sustainable? Right. A few months ago, if you asked me whether Trump 
you know, faced bigger political danger or legal danger. You know, I, I thought that this was going to be litigated through the political system, through the primary uh, campaign. You know, and I, I actually think now that Trump's fate may end up being determined through these cases, whether it's uh, D.A. Bragg's case, which I think looks like the flimsiest case. I mean, the good news for Donald Trump, Jared, is that uh, a lot of legal mm-hmm. voices on the left, a lot of anti-Trump Republicans like Mitt Romney or Jeb Bush have been very critical of D.A. Bragg and, mm-hmm. and, and the case that he brought. It's not as substantive, if you believe the legal analysis, as a lot of anti-Trump uh, folks had hoped for. But as you note, Jared, there, there are two other big cases or, more, you know, you have the, the Fulton County case with Fonnie mm-hmm. Willis uh, in Georgia uh, focused on whether Trump undermined the, the Georgia election by threatening uh, the Georgia Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger. And you have the, the special counsel, Jack Smith's uh, uh, investigation over January 6th, and also the former president's alleged mishandling of sensitive government records. So there are a bunch of legal balls that the Trump folks are going to be juggling, potentially. And you're right, that we don't know where that's going to go. Politically, though... Boy, just look at every every poll that's come out in the last few weeks, both right around the time of the indictment and the few polls we've seen post-indictment. Trump has, has surged to a 30, 35-point lead in the, in the primary. He's doing about as well as he, he's done in the polls ever since leaving office. And it's hard to see in the short or medium term that, that dynamic changing anytime soon. One of the issues as well is we sort of look at how the legal aspect of this and the political aspect of this intertwine is this uh, looming question of a a gag order and the judge overseeing uh, this case has not imposed one, but has sort of uh, warned both sides that, you know, the rhetoric needs to stay respectful in that he could change his calculation as it relates to a uh, a gag order. You know, in the remarks that Trump made at Mar-a-Lago, he in passing sort of made, I think he called the judge a, a Trump hater or his family Trump haters. Um, it's been obviously very critical of prosecutors. Is that going to be a, a, a needle that Trump is going to have to thread as he goes back out here on the campaign trail over the next uh, several months? Because, again, the next court session is not expected before December 4th. That's right. I mean, look, Trump listening to that speech is playing with legal fire. He he went after the prosecutor Bragg. He went after the judge. Jack he went after Smith. the judge's daughter. <laughs> Uh, boy, I mean, it, look, it, you know, I, I, I certainly think that Trump's lawyers are going to be talking to him and urging him to zip it up going forward. Uh, that may have opened Trump up to some additional legal jeopardy. I don't know how the judge will respond, but boy, that was a frontal attack against the judge who was going to be hearing the evidence and deciding, uh, or at least f- overseeing this case uh, so- in, in, in New York. And I, boy, I, I can't imagine Trump's legal team listened to the comments at Mar-a-Lago and thought he was doing himself any good. Let's talk about the field, the, the emerging Republican field. By and large, even those who are already in the race or those who are probably very close to jumping in the race have been very supportive of Trump as it relates to this indictment, right? They have questioned uh, the validity of it. They have accused uh, the DA of of, uh, this political prosecution and not a legal prosecution. What is the strategy here if you are challenging Donald Trump for the Republican nomination how do you sort of appeal to that base which is sizable while also trying to to chart your own course and and if you have not yet gotten into the race are you reconsidering it after what we've seen over the last few weeks well number one the fact that almost every leading rival to trump for the republican nomination defended the the Mm -hmm. former president tells you all you need to know about where the republican party is circa april 2023 hmm. usually when when a, when a candidate is indicted you go out you attack them you would that think that would norm. be like the first line of attack right that, that, that is like uh, you know my opponent has been indicted <laughs> case closed right i mean yeah that's that's politics 101 <laughs> politics 101 candidate indicted the fact that everyone other than Chris Christie and newly minted candidate Asa Hutchinson, that, that Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, you know, Glenn Youngkin, everyone in the mix for the presidential campaign defended uh, the, the front runner, 
uh, it tells you all you need to know about where the Republican Party is. And frankly, if, if they can, they're not going to go after Trump for you know being indicted. Uh, it's going to be hard to so, I mean, see any of them winning question. the nomination. So, like, what do they do to run against Trump then? Well, look, ultimately, I, that's what they are doing, right? They're trying to convince Republican voters that you know even if. They are all in on everything that, that Trump did as president. It's time to turn the page. It's time to move on. How do you make that argument while also saying he is, you know, being made an example of and this is unfair and this is unjust and they're going after you and the movement and all of that, right? The best way, I think, to understand the Republican strategies for like a DeSantis or a Haley or the leading challengers is that they're, they're kind of praying or hoping or keeping their fingers crossed that the legal jeopardy, the legal challenges that Trump faces become so significant that maybe he can't feasibly run for president and deal with his legal case. And if that is the case, then perhaps being seen as a pro-Trump Republican uh, will carry some weight if, if Trump isn't actually running in the end. I, I, I think that's wishful thinking. I think uh, given how uh, legal experts have analyzed the New York case, I, I think uh, that's going to push him out of the presidential campaign is, is, is fanciful. And there's been a lot of wishful thinking in Republican politics for the last uh, eight years or so. And I think this is one more example of no one being willing to frontally attack Trump. They're worried that the voters in the Republican Party overwhelmingly are supportive of Trump no matter what. And they're afraid to be the one person going after him and finding their own support dissipating if they do so. We'll finish with this, the uh, speech that the former president delivered at Mar-a-Lago here uh, following his, his arraignment in New York City covered a lot of ground. It was about 20 minutes or so, 21, 22 minutes. Is that the model now for, for the events, for the rallies he's going to have moving forward? In other words, did we sort of get a preview now of what a, I guess we could call it a stump speech might look like uh, while he is moving forward and in, in fighting these criminal charges? I don't think so. I, I, I think his campaign, if you talk to his advisors tonight, they, they don't want that to be the stump speech. They, they, they'll rather have the two-hour greatest hits of, of 2020 than, than what you saw. Look, that was a parade of grievances. He got into quite a litany of arguments against some of these cases against him, but uh, that, that's not the greatest hits. That was legal minutia and, and, and just kind of just an angry Trump letting off some steam in Mar-a-Lago. It reminded me a little bit more of the low-energy performance uh, in Mar-a-Lago when he announced his campaign uh, last November. Uh, so I, I don't think, if, if that's what you're going to be seeing from Trump uh, after after his legal predicament, that, then maybe it is, it is good news for the other Republicans looking to make some inroads. But look, I, people have written Trump off. Trump, Trump is been down but he's never been out and uh i i was surprised jared just watching him on the campaign trail seeing him in person i, I expected more of the the kind of original uh mar-a-lago kind of despondent figure uh and and he turned things around and he actually uh had a had a pretty sharp message at cpac and at some of the other events he's done over the last couple months so look sure. I, I i don't think his advisors want him to repeat that speech that, that they want him to avoid the legal talk on the campaign trail uh, the more he talks about minutia like that, the more he's going to put his audiences to sleep. Uh, but he does the overall sense of grievance, the overall tone, the overall belief that the elites and the establishment are out to get the average guy. I mean, that is the sweet spot for Trump's rhetoric. And I think you'll be hearing those broad themes uh, and you'll continue to hear those broad themes in the, in the campaign trail from Trump in the, in the days and months to come. All right. Well, we are uh, months away from the first uh, ballots being cast, caucus goers and primary voters uh, casting ballots. And we'll have a lot more discussions uh, between uh, now and then. Uh, Josh Crossauer, always a pleasure. Enjoyed uh, the conversation. Uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Jared. This is Nicole Parker with your Fox News commentary coming up. How long will the U.S. support the war in Ukraine? And what does China's rapid expansion of its military mean for the U.S.? Those are just a couple of the questions that Army General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin took from members of Congress. General Mark Milley explains. We don't want a great power war with China. Uh, we want to prevent that. And the way to prevent it is a strong, powerful military 
uh, demonstrated will to use it if necessary, and that they clearly and unambiguously understand it. China has been a main focus of these hearings as concerns from top defense officials grow that the Chinese military may outpace our own as the U.S. is grappling with a military recruitment crisis. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin tried to assure lawmakers that the military was tackling this issue. This is not the first time that the uh, military has been faced with challenges in recruiting. It'll take uh, a while to... Uh, to come out of that bathtub and, and, and get to where we need to be. But I am confident that, that we'll get there. Meanwhile, lawmakers on Capitol Hill have been emphasizing their concerns as intelligence shows that China has been heavily investing in its own armed forces. Well, listen, it's grown significantly. Joining me is Congressman Rob Whitman of Virginia. Yeah, I put a slide up the other day in our hearing there on the House Armed Services Committee, and it's staggering the growth that we've seen in the Chinese military from essentially 1999 to present, and then the track that they're on for future military growth. They outpace us in just about every element of our strategic forces, whether it's ships, whether it's weapons, whether it's land systems, you know, those things that you need for an army, land vehicles, tanks, artillery, all of those elements. They have outpaced us in space, although we are catching up there. They have uh, also had another uh, area that's that's really concerning to me, and that is hy hypersonics. So they have uh, really accelerated uh, what they're doing in hypersonics. We're running to catch up. The single place where we have an advantage over them is in, in the undersea world. Our submarine force is about the only place where we have any superiority. And if you take the total formula and add it up, we are well behind the Chinese. And that ought to just sober us all to the threat that we face. And it's what keeps me up at night, the challenge that we face now. And it only gets larger in the future if we really don't get our resolve on track to counter what the Chinese are doing. So what is it specifically that you're proposing? Well, on, on a number of different levels, for, first of all is, is you know, we cannot capitulate to the Chinese. We have to work in all the different areas. This isn't just a strategic battle. It's also a battle in, in the fiscal areas. We have, to, we have to be very aggressive to make sure that uh, people know when they are investing in funds that actually go to the Chinese Communist Party. Another thing, too, is U.S. companies cannot capitulate to China and turn over their intellectual property, which is how China operates. We also have to build a military uh, that has the ability to counter China. And we have to build it in smart ways. We have to build things that can immediately pose a threat to China. Going off of that, at the military budget hearing, uh, you argue that the budget doesn't meet the realities of the threats from our adversaries. But Secretary Austin's counter argument to that is that really what we're looking at is the quality of the coalition, not specifically the quantity, the numbers, noting that allies and partners would be a part of that coalition and ensuring that there would be extra support. So what is your response to his counter argument? My response to his counter argument is that's not correct, period. It's, it's not correct from this standpoint. Quantity has a quality all of its own. If you look at all the aspects where the Chinese outpace us, not only in quantity, but now in quality, they are putting together platforms that are incredibly, incredibly uh, effective and can hold us at risk at long distance. I mean, to the point where we can't even get inside that, that threat ring to deliver our weapons. And, you know, it's great to have friends, but the question is, is will our friends be there if an outbreak occurs? We don't have uh, formal agreements that say if there is a conflict with China that these allies will be there with us. It's totally up to them as to whether or not they're going to be there. So the question is, is if China tries to take Taiwan, will those friends be there? It's great to have these relationships, but will those friends go to battle with us? Yeah, well, speaking of impacts of other countries around the world, other territories, you know, you've talked about this uh, at a great deal, saying that we need to be watching what China's doing around the world. So in terms of, of aid and investments in Africa and Central America, what are some of the points that you're arguing in that? Well, I'm arguing that where China is investing is in areas that will provide them resources that they need to grow economically, uh, but also to grow militarily and strategically. If you look at uh, rare earth elements, critical critical minerals, 
Uh, they are around the world getting into these countries, South America and Africa, uh, exercising their negotiating skills with those countries, getting agreements that allow them to uh, to access, to process those 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 rare earth elements, those critical minerals. You know, they 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 have about seventy percent of the extraction capability. Uh, throughout the world. 70% of what's available in the world, they have the extraction capability there. They have about 90% of the refining capability. So let's put this in reality of what China is doing around the world. And listen, they're not there to be friends with those countries. They are there as a transactional nation. They are there to say, hey, here, we'll give you a little bit, but in return, they have these long-term agreements that let them extract and process these critical minerals around the world. Would that not be somewhat of a similar argument that maybe China would have in response to the U.S. and other allies making investments in general around the world and other developing countries? Well, it, we are not making those same sorts of investments. I, I, of I only course. wish, yeah, I, I only wish, wish we were. They are making strategic investments. You know, when USAID goes to these different countries and helps, you know, we're looking to do basic things like feed people, like provide. Mm-hmm healthcare to people. Those are the places where where we are investing. Uh, China is 100% transactional. They'll come in and build a road or build a building and go, look, look, look how nice we are to you. But then they are there to exploit those natural resources. So even people in the country aren't benefiting from this. That's how transactional China is. Now, switching gears a little bit back to another main topic that we heard at this military budget hearing was Ukraine. So one of the repeated topics, both in terms of of weapons provided and the long term commitment to supporting the war. So what were some of the the feedback, the comments that marked you the most of what was most maybe possibly the, the largest takeaways from that topic? Well, it's not. I think there are several things. One is, is that we need to do everything possible to make sure that the weapons that we're sending there are in the hands of Ukrainian military members and that they are being utilized on the front. And I understand we have inspector generals there on the ground. That's great. I understand that we are going to uh, extraordinary lengths to make sure we're tracking all of that. That's great. But I still think that there are some elements that are missing. I haven't seen or heard from anybody that there's actually an intelligence operation trying to gather intelligence on who might be trying to intercept these weapons. I think it's I think it's fine to help Ukraine. I, I do think in the long term that helps the United States, especially if this could spill over into NATO countries that would invoke Article 5, and then we would be involved with boots on the ground. But I think it's incredibly important to have a strategy because you can't just keep writing the check uh, ad infinitum without any understanding about what's what's the what's the strategy. And part of that conversation during the hearing was that the goal, according to President Biden, has remained that Ukraine must remain a free state with all of its territories intact. And one of the conversations in that was that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has said that territory includes Crimea, which has, of course, been contested since 2014. So did that alarm you? Well, that's, you know, that's that's another condition that makes it incredibly difficult going forward uh, to seek any sort of uh, agreement with Russia. Uh, I don't know that that's where any sort of negotiation to end the conflict would 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 end up. And, And obviously, Russia wants all the eastern territory in Ukraine, as well as Crimea, essentially a land bridge to Crimea. And. Ukraine is going to want all that territory to remain sovereign in addition to uh, the area in Crimea that was taken uh, against their will. So I understand that's where both sides are going to start off. Uh, the question is, is, if, is that where they will end? Other topics discussed, of course, at this hearing were the development of technologies, whether that's hypersonic technology, artificial intelligence, investing in training, the family members involved, uh, health care for service members continually protecting our country in all of this was there anything that struck you that you were you were especially pleased with during this hearing well yes i i think that there uh that that there are efforts to make sure that in the area of taking care of our military families that folks are very aware how incredibly important that is. In fact, I was just speaking today with General McConville, who's the chief of the Army, and they understand that there are issues with recruiting 
and for that matter, retention really center around what are they doing to take care of soldiers and their families? And, and I think that's key. And, you know, it's it's one thing to realize that, but it's another thing to make sure that comes to fruition. Also, you know, the effort to modernize our military has to take place at a at a significant rate and what I call the rate of relevance. We have to make sure that we have a force that's relevant tomorrow in the day after, you know, the days where we had years and years and years to develop new platforms because there was nobody that was competing with us. Those days are gone. We have to have a level of urgency in how we develop uh, new weapon systems. And we have to be thoughtful too, because there's not an unlimited amount of resources in the United States. I want to make sure that each and every day, uh, Xi Jinping wakes up and goes, no, not today, because he looks at the scenario and says, no, I just don't think things are going to end well if we try to take Taiwan or if we try to take on the United States today. But I'm still very, very mindful that he will, I believe, try to test us in every in every way possible. Congressman Rob Whitman, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for your insight and your time. Alex, thank you. Other news. I'm Gianna Jalosi. What's that smell? Smelling other people's body odor is usually undesirable, but a study from Sweden suggests BO could also be an alternative therapy for social anxiety. The lead researcher said when people are in a certain state of mind and then sweat, their perspiration includes certain molecules or chemo signals that convey their emotional state and elicit corresponding responses to those that smell it. The researchers collected sweat from volunteers who watched clips of movies to induce emotions. Next, 48 women who were experiencing social anxiety were exposed to different odors, some of which included those sweat samples along with mindfulness therapy. They found that sweat therapy, when combined with mindfulness, produced better results in treating social anxiety than mindfulness alone. But researchers were also surprised to find sweat produced while someone was happy had the same effect as someone who had been scared by that movie clip. The researchers planned to do an additional study to confirm these findings, and they're working to determine which molecules in human sweat reduce anxiety levels. For the Fox News Rundown, I'm Gianna Gelosi. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. I'm Dana Perino. Join me for season three of my limited time podcast, Everything Will Be Okay, based on my best selling book of the same name. Make sure you subscribe to this series wherever you download podcasts and leave a rating and review. Subscribe to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Nicole Parker. What's on your mind? Who wants to feel that they were hired for a job in order to fill a quota? Certainly not me. On February 24th, 2019, a fellow FBI agent told me there was a photograph of me published on the Wall Street Journal's website. I was puzzled. As agents, we avoid the media. I checked their website. Sure enough, there was an article titled FBI's Most Wanted, More Applicants for Special Agents. It included an open source photograph of me wearing my FBI ray jacket conducting an investigation with the caption, the FBI has shifted recruitment efforts to reach more minority and female candidates. I was demoralized, as it implied that I was some token female agent hire. That was exactly what I tried to distance myself from being labeled as my entire FBI career. I share this with humility. I was told by an FBI interviewer that I earned a perfect score on the phase two oral exam. He explained it was rare, as he could count on one hand the number of candidates who had received a perfect score in his 20 plus years of testing applicants. I was not a courtesy check the box to fulfill the female special agent quota hire, and no one should be. Tenacity, perseverance, and integrity enabled me to financially support myself since I got my first job at the age of 15. There has been a lowering of the eligibility requirements to become an FBI special agent, and many believe that hurts the agency's overall performance. This concerned many of my former colleagues who surmised that the standards were lowered to accommodate a more diverse workforce. As a woman, I do not believe it is appropriate to reduce any hiring requirement or process to accommodate my gender. One should be hired based on their merit, period. These are a few examples that illustrate the lowering of agent requirements. The FBI lowered the physical fitness test, also known as the PFT, score necessary to enter Quantico significantly. The FBI has made the drug use requirement more lenient, 
In 2010, when I started the FBI Academy at Quantico, the new agent training was 20 weeks. It has been reduced to 16 weeks. FBI special agents should be hired and promoted based on their credentials. Agents must be fully confident that individuals going through a door with them on a dangerous operation are qualified. You must be willing to put your life on the line to protect one another and innocent civilians. Unfortunately, some skilled individuals who may have wanted to apply for the FBI in the past may not have an interest now because of its tarnished reputation. Furthermore, there is a general disrespect for law enforcement because of the defund the police, anti-cop atmosphere that has swept the nation. This has led to a mass exodus of experienced law enforcement officers. Although candidates are allegedly applying to the FBI in droves, what matters is candidate quality, not quantity. No one should be hired in order to fulfill a quota. As a female, I find that insulting. No one wants to feel like a pity hire, but more importantly, there is much at stake. Competent and qualified FBI agents hired based on strict criteria equate to safety and security for Americans. In times of crisis, most do not care what the identity of the person is protecting them. They care that they and their loved ones are being protected by the bravest, most capable and honorable agents. The FBI should keep their standards high for new recruits. Americans deserve this. This is Nicole Parker, former FBI special agent. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. And now, stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. Listen ad-free on Fox News Podcasts Plus on Apple Podcasts. And Prime members can listen to the show ad-free on Amazon Music. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. Hey, it's Will Kane, co-host of Fox & Friends Weekend. Join me as I share my thoughts on a wide range of topics from sports and pop culture to politics and business. The Will Kane Podcast. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Love Fox News? Click the subscribe button to get more of the news and opinion you trust. And click the Fox News Rundown playlist for the latest episodes.